My name is Jerry Howard. I'm, uh, I will be in conversation uh, with Richard here, drawing in softballs. Um, and, uh, first off, I want to thank everybody for coming out uh, tonight to this event uh, today uh, when you could have been raking leaves. Um, I'm, I'm, so, I'm really, I'm always happy when, whenever we have an author up here. Uh, but I'm like really, really happy to have uh, Richard here because I know him and because of how interesting his book is. This all started, um, I think, in, would have been in the spring when I was reading The New Yorker and uh, I'm reading a review uh, by Louis Manan, who's always uh, well worth reading, about a book called Making History. Uh, the storytellers who uh, shaped the past, and I, it was a very good review, by the way, very good. And um, and I thought, wow, this is this, wow, this sounds like an interesting book. This oh, it's by this fellow Richard Cohen. I, I wonder where he teaches um, because it sounded like a book by somebody who teaches. And then it, and then the penny dropped. Oh. <laughs> That's Richard. That's Richard Cohen. He's gone and written another book. Um, so right at this, um, at that point, I said, I have to get him up to, to the library. This is this is all um, too interesting, as you will very shortly um, experience. Uh, I'll make the introduction uh, brief. Richard is a member of my tribe, publishers. He had a storied career in British publishing for a couple of few decades. Um, he has written um, two previous books, one about the sun uh, as a kind of a kind of cultural history of the sun, I guess, cultural scientific history of the sun and um, the history of fencing. And to this point among Richard's ridiculous number of uh, accomplishments. He do uh, were on the British Olympic fencing team, which not that many people can say that, folks. Let's, <laughs> let's uh, face it. Uh, he ran a uh, for a couple of years this humongous uh, uh, writers' conference or festival in in the UK. Um, uh, the Hay on Y Festival, or did I, did I get that? Um, it's actually called the Cheltenham Sorry. History Festival. Oh, oh that's the other, that's the other festival. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, he, the dude does it all. Uh, and um, and I'm just, uh, thank you so much for coming up to talk to us about uh, history. So that's that's where we're, we're going to start. Um, and so we better get get down to it because almost literally, we um, we have to get through all the recorded history in the next hour. Uh, so we're going to talk very fast. Uh, uh, and uh, let's. Um, I just want to start with with unpacking the title. Um, so. Because that has implications. Um, making history implies that history isn't something that simply exists, it's something that is made or rather created. And your subtitle, The Storytellers Who Shape the Past, implies that narrative or story is a central component of this thing we call history. I wonder if you could. Uh, Elaborate on this or correct me, or just tell us more about your intentions in writing this book. Well, first of all, Jerry, thank you for inviting me and thank you all for coming. And I hope you can understand my not American accent. <laughs> when I first came over here, lured by the siren sitting at the back there um, to marry her in 1999, I used to pick up the phone to make, say, I get onto the operator and say, I want to make a transfer charge call, whatever it's called. And she wouldn't understand me at all. And I then say, oh, I want to make a transfer charge call. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm learning. 
Yeah, don't do that again. <laughs> um, on, on making history um, and the subtitle, I think that I say two things. The first is that history means two things. Um, it seems obvious, but it's a crucial distinction between the two. One is the past, and the second is um, recording the past, whether it's um, in writing or film or other means. Um, so that history comes to us in the first sense through the filter of the second. Um, and that seemed to me, um, therefore, um, making history is both putting on record, but also the sense of shaping it according to one's own character and agenda. And storytellers is in there um, because I wanted not to, as it were, take a kick at academic historians, but to show that if you take the criterion of um, who have influenced us most about the past, it's very much not academic historians. He ranges from the lot of us who certainly was given no chair of history because they didn't have them, through to Shakespeare has probably formed um, our idea of English Tudor history and Roman, ancient Roman history, more than any other person um, throughout time, um, to the writers of the Bible, um, and of course, um, novelists, historical novelists. So it was storytellers, not historians, um, who, who were my, my natural point. So with apologies to anybody here who's an alum, alumnus or an alumna of uh, Amherst, there's a, there's a very telling moment in your book where, where you, uh, you're at a conference at Amherst and a professor uh, who hears your, your talk says, you know, you'd never get make, you'd never get tenure at Amherst. Yeah, uh, well, that was laying it, laying it on the line for me. He said, um, do you approach your subject horizontally? We do it vertically here. Meaning, you know, we go, um, the importance of spoons in Chilean 14th century history, you know, you've, you've got to dig deep, even at the um, yeah. It's only, you know, if you get interviewed with somebody and they've got a whole lot of index cards in front of you, it's really <laughs> 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 Life here works very well. <laughs> um, so let's get to this gentleman, Herodotus, who some people say is the man who invented history. Uh, other people have called him the father of lies. That was Plutarch, I guess. Um, so uh, this gentleman, as all these smart people were, was a Greek lived about 450 BCE. How did he invent history? What, what, and what was there before he invented it? What did we have before we had it? No, not much. You had, I mean, apart from the fact that you've got no idea what was there, because so much is lost. Maybe there were wonderful historians before a lot of us at the same time. We don't know. Um, there, were, there are fragments of cultures, various others. But the one of us was. Um, an outsider, um, people say that history is written by the winners. It's very often not. If you think of just Herodotus and then Thucydides, um, Herodotus was from uh, an off island. He wasn't part of the Greek mainland at all. Thucydides was a, a, a Greek general who'd been given the sack, if you like, put out the pasture. Um, and you go on through um, historians through the ages. Um, Clarendon, the English historian, or uh, anyway, um, and Herodotus um, was not um, one of an Athenian who was part of the great and powerful. Um, he was a traveler, could have been a sea captain, um, and he was fueled by maybe one of the main qualities for any historian of quality an intense curiosity. And he traveled um, throughout what he thought of as um, the known world. And um, did he make things up? Certainly. Um, you know, whether it was men with their heads in their chests or um, human beings who could fly. Or, uh, there's a range of wonderfully readable, daft material in his writings. 
at the same time as, uh, along with that curiosity, went tremendous sense of observation. He was a ge geographer, a sociologist, um, uh, economist, uh, a whole range of disciplines which we now separate up in separate schools. But they all came together in him, and he would write about anything that caught his fancy. Um, so you've got this outsider traveling as much as he could. Um, and in those days, you could often be taken in um, by basically uh, people in countries you visited under the Greek principle of Xenia, where you would take in a stranger like the natural act of hospitality. Um, also, the Greeks were sufficiently found there. You had to argue who the stranger was. It was better to be generous anyway. Um, so he was, as I say, uh, the person who first exemplified what the historian has got to be interested in the worlds he discovered. So you mentioned uh, the other guy, Thucydides, who was uh, who was an Athenian, um, uh, got sacked because he lost he lost so many battles. Um, but he he wrote a different kind of history. Um, he would you would say he was the inventor of um, of political and military history and probably used more directly to the actual facts as they occurred? Well, um, I do point out that in one crucial aspect, um, he could invent according to his own agenda, because one of the things which particularly interested me, um, and was, I suppose one of the themes of the book, is how the people who have given us our histories um, write from their own perspective, their own agendas, whether they're conscious agendas or not. And um, Thucydides certainly had uh, a notion of the kind of history, the kind of version of events um, he wanted people to take to take in. Um, but he he never is like um, you know in the old days, Biden making a speech about Trump, never mentioned his name. Thucydides never mentions the name of Herodotus, but he talks about people, terrible historians who make things up uh, and don't um, restrict themselves to what is known. But um, I forget what proportions uh, in this interview is, but um, I mean, given that one copy of the New York Times um, has more words in it than all the recorded um, words in Thucydides. Um, so one's talking about still a lot of words, but a finite amount. Um, and he um, um, invents continually in that a huge proportion uh, of his history um, is speeches. And he's brilliant at it. Um, you know, you'd have the Thucydides writing your political speeches um, any, any day of the week. Um, and he brings to life uh, in a very dramatic way, the way he thinks people spoke. But of course, um, very often, um, he's going just on reports of what people said. He certainly wasn't a witness at the time. Um, and um, there, he never says, um, I'm just making it up. He says, well, this is almost what I think they ought to have said. You know, you know that, that really, this is a little, uh, by the way, but it really struck me because when I, when I, it, I edited a book by William Sapphire, which was a collection of great, called Lend Me Your Ears, uh, Great Speeches in History. And, and the text of the speeches, all, especially the early ones, all came from reference books. And so you have Pericles addressing the Athenians. And I, I, I thought, now, was there a scribe taking down Pericles' speeches? And, and how sound is this um, text? And I thought, should I ask? And I said, Nah, I mean, we'll never, we'll never get the book into production. But uh, clearly, the, the speeches that were that that um, Sapphire put in from Pericles and quite a lot of other people were like just sort of made up. So, yeah, and he wasn't a one-off. I mean, when Samuel Johnson was beginning his career, um, if you know, if any of you look at my books, um, I, I'm self-indulgent in my use. Of Nineteen footnotes, which I think is fun. But one of the, the footnotes talks about Samuel Johnson when he was a parliamentary uh, journalist. 
um, early on in his career, he would write up what people had said. He hadn't even attended the debates. He just decided what they should have said. And damn it, they didn't sound better than they ever did in their entire life. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take Samuel Johnson as my ghostwriter any day. So let's speed across the Mediterranean in a few centuries and let's get to everybody's favorite um, empire, aside from the British Empire, uh, the Roman Empire. And um, so the, the, the Caesars just hold such a, a place in our uh, imagination. Uh, of, of history, of, you know, the first five, or, and and um, and they're generally considered to be really terrible people, you know. And but I, I've not I've noticed in a lot of my reading that actually, they, you know, Nero, not such a bad guy. Uh, you know, Caligula, <laughs> misunderstood. Um, and the people who wrote about, who wrote the books that so much of what our ideas about, about um, the Caesars uh, derive from really had an agenda and um, maybe made up a lot of stuff too. So if we could talk about that, these Tacitus and Suetonius and those 12 Caesars and all that, all those, those people. Well, I think that still, if you read I mean, reading um, the ancient Roman historians goes back to when I was with studying Latin uh, uh, as a nervous 13, 14 year old. Uh, and that's probably ruined me for life psychologically. But Tacitus and Caesar, particularly, are still tremendous to read. Um, but um, Tacitus and Livy, particularly, um, are writers with a strong, as they would say themselves, moral. A purpose. They wrote history um, not only to record the wonderful city of Rome, but also to show how corrupted it had become and how they really, as great moral arbiters of their time, were going to show um, what the proper way of living should be. Um, and um, luckily for us, um, in their way, they were like you know, um, the way English television does. Um, Tudor history, um, the soap operas of television now, um, by writing about the awful sins of Nero or um, Tiberius or whoever it might be. Caligula. Um, or Caligula. Um, Not to forget Caligula. Um, they, they have wonderful stories to tell. And one of my favorites I put in my book, which was not about Caligula, I'm afraid, um, was about how the musicians of Rome were going on strike. And they were invited out outside of Rome, um, to one of their kind of last dues before they refused to play. And they were plied with food and drink, but especially drink, until they reached the stage when they all collapsed in the heat, absolutely sozzled. And they were put on trucks, um, hay carts and so on, and delivered to the center of the Senate um, in Rome and woke up the next morning. And they thought, God, we better play after all. <laughs> so, actually, Karen, um, a specific question. Did, speaking of my favorite guy, Caligula, <laughs> did, did he actually have a horse, have his horse inducted into the Roman Senate? Yes or no? Yes. And how do you know this? I have my sources in my closet. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So, it, speeding ahead 1,500 years, which is actually not such a strange segue, um, we come to Shakespeare, who, um, in, in, as you quite rightly say, has um, more than any single human being, I suspect, uh, shaped our, our sense of, of, the, of the past, or at least huge swatch is of your past. Um, you, you say in your book, writing about the past would never be the same. And you know, his history plays about the War of the Roses and the Hundred Year War, and his plays about ancient uh, Rome and Greece essentially own our minds as 
as to the events he imagined, um, however inaccurately. Um, so just tell us how history through Shakespeare and his other and the other dramatists uh, of his time sort of became mass entertainment uh, in his hands. Well, my sources tell me, okay. but there was no television around that yeah. time. <laughs> and so the main, the main sources of uh, entertainment um, were um, the theater, um, sermons in church, and town criers. I didn't actually put that in the book, but town criers would go around um, towns reciting the events of the day. You know, they were one form of historians of their time. But the theater was amazing. I mean, we went through periods in Shakespeare's time, it's also the time of Webster, and Middleton, and Paul, um, and others. Um, an extraordinarily rich time in terms of talented um, dramatists. Um, a number of periods, it was outlawed. Um, if you had a Puritan mayor or king or whatever, the, the theatres would be shut down. Um, and even when they were open, they were uh, in competition with bear baiting or organised fights. When I was writing my book about the history of sword play, um, there would be tremendous fights with swords or clubs or various other forms of arms, um, um, which would rival the best of. Uh, uh, modern TV. Executions were very popular too. Yeah. Um, um, it's not a joke. <laughs> um, uh, at least they were free, um, but the theatre was amazingly cheap. Um, you know, there were different prices, but for a penny or whatever it might be, um, you could go to the theatre. And um, the Rose Theatre, which you've heard about, was relatively small, um, but the Globe was of a pretty decent size. Um, and it's amazing when you think of small groups of actors having to learn parts. The turnover of plays was extraordinarily um, uh, rapid, and the number of plays put on in a week um, equally rapid. So in terms of theatre going, it was a wonderful source of entertainment. And you could see, you know, three or four plays in a week if you're in central London. But so, but there's more to it than just entertainment, as you you say in the book. There, it, a lot of it was, uh, especially the English history plays, uh, especially Henry the Fourth Part Two, where it was nationalist propaganda. I mean, England was feeling its oats at that point, having defeated uh, the Spanish Armada and was on the edge of becoming a. Uh, global power. So you needed to, I, Shakespeare was playing along with the national imagination to create a sense of England as England, right? Well, Shakespeare wrote 37 plays, or you might say 38, um, if you're not saying it's the other books or whatever. Um, and over the half of them either are histories or were written as histories, in the sense of the history of King Lear or whatever it's called. Um, and they again very much had a pro Tudor agenda. Um, his, uh, Shakespeare was writing history to show um, that um, the kings of his time, the kings of his time, Elizabeth, James I, um, were part of a particularly honorable tradition. Um, there's a point um, about two thirds of the way through his career when that wobbled slightly, and then uh, he returns to um, writing according to a particular line. Um, and he also got into trouble because, of course, um, the king's censor um, made sure that there were good executions to go to people who uh, overstepped the mark in the plays that they wrote. Um, so Shakespeare was being both politically adept and politically um, careful. Um, but every play he wrote had a political purpose. Um, whatever other great themes and intentions are in his plays. Um, and um, it's not just Henry the Fourth Part Two, it's 
the Roman kings, um, Antony, Cleopatra, Cogolinus, Julius Caesar, um, very obviously um, have uh, a contemporary political subtext. So this is ravingly achronological. I'll just throw it at you. So we're doing our uh, cultural duty and watching The Crown. Is Peter Morgan our Shakespeare? And is Netflix our globe? Peter Morgan, yes or no? <laughs> Peter, Morgan, Peter Morgan went to the same school as I did. Um, a, a Roman Catholic school buried in the part of the countryside in Somerset. Um, and I feel therefore an alumnus loyalty and say, of course, it's the, the contemporary dramatist of moment. Okay. Do you like the, uh, the crown? Um, as history or entertainment or both? I like it as entertainment. Yeah. Um, I think Peter Morgan is a very cunning writer. Yeah. Um, I shouldn't say so um, amongst the cast who work well for him. They don't like him much. Um, there you go, folks. <laughs> I, I shouldn't say that. All right. Um, <laughs> um, um, but um, I, I think that his, uh, not just The Crown, but um, his play about Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, um, his play, his film The Queen, I mean, he's done extraordinary body work. Patches, most recently. Yeah, I, I'm not putting him on a uh, level of Shakespeare, but I think in some ways it's fulfilling some of the same um, function that people really, really want to have their imagination of their, the leaders and the people in their public life, in the public life, um, fleshed out and given, and given imaginative. I would, I would say this about the crown generally. I remember when Chariots of Fire Came out. Remember that film um, about the, the Olympic Games um, and Abrams, the, the kind of meter sprinter. Um, people said it's got the film gets certain things factually wrong. It just didn't happen, or they're, they're askew. And I think that in the kind of discussions we've seen over the Crown, an extraordinary amount of, of um, articles written about the TV series, um, people forget that. Um, it's not just that this is a dramatization. It's not trying to say he's got the same authority as a documentary or is, has to abide by the same rules. I think that people will watch something like The Crown and they will know that it's dramatized, that it makes things up, and that it's um, a large slice that's fictional. But they like the experience of feeling that they are being given the truth. And it's a kind of unstated alliance between the creators and the audience that people will enjoy the sensation of thinking, goodness, I just witnessed the inside story of what Charles wanted to do about his father's long reign. And part of them knows that they are fantasizing, but it's the way we take in um, TV, novels, whatever, that we, we like to be duped even as we know we're being duped because of the pleasure it gives us. I actually want to revisit this when we get to the, no, uh, the, the history novelist, um, which is of particular interest to me. But uh, so I, we really have to pause to consider the life and the person of Edward Gibbon, who uh, with Louis Manan started with Gibbon in his review, who is, of course, the author of the the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, um, which every, I assume everybody has read. Um, so Gibbon's voice in that book, as far as I'm concerned, is pretty much the voice of God. You know, if God had gone to a, a British public school, you know. Um, I mean, the authority of the writing is just unmatched in English. And, and it occurred to me that, like, Gibbon stands to the writing of his time that that Orwell stands to the writing of Barton. That's the way you're supposed to write. This is this is the way you're supposed to write. And then you come to find out that Edward Gibbon, with his godlike powers, was really a mess, uh, a comical mess in in body and spirit. And 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 how do you reconcile that style 
in that mind with that body and that personality that we had. But tell us a little, tell us about it, Gibbon, please. Um, I think good Gibbon is absolutely wonderful, and a lot of Gibbon is really hard going. Um, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, and I hope you read the abridged version. Um, I've read some. Um, and if you want to know <coughs> um, how I feel about Gibbon, Clyde James um, wrote about Gibbon in one of his essay collections, and it's a brilliant takedown of the Gibbon style. Um, Balance to this, um, this, that. I mean, and, and all the tricks of, of all rhetoric. All are. tricks. Um, but Gibbon, um, there's a chapter in my book called The Wounded Historian, where I talk about physical frailties, either from <coughs> disease or um, accident or whatever it might be, um, suffered by a person who's writing history, <coughs> then becomes part consciously or unconsciously of their agenda when writing. And Gibbon um, was very short, five foot three, was it? Um, around that kind of size, which even then was considered short. He, um, although at one time, um, he was a serving soldier, he never saw um, a bit of a battle, but um, he really enjoyed being a soldier, um, along with his father. Um, he was, um, Ginger had, uh, I don't say, um, overweight. He had so many physical problems with his body. Um, um, some which I won't repeat today. Yeah, it's a little upsetting. Um, <laughs> but, um, um, he, later on in his life, um, fell in love with a woman and took her for a walk in his garden um, in Switzerland and fell down on her knee and proposed to her. And she just burst out laughing. Mm. She's not a woman, you're proposing to her. Um, <laughs> but he had to be helped to his feet because he couldn't do it himself. Um, so really, he was imprisoned by a body that wasn't working. And he was writing about a period in history of the body beautiful, um, a very hedonistic society. So to my mind, anyway, the intensity of, of his ironic stance comes from his looking on from this awful body. Um, being able to criticize um, the iniquities, the indecencies, the degradations of the beautiful society. And on, on the subject of bodily infirmity, um, uh, there's a very, well, at least one time well known uh, American historian, Prescott, who wrote about the Incas and the, the Spanish conquests, of, who was literally. I, I mean, 99, he was blind, which is kind of a problem for a, um, a, a historian working from these sources. And yet he overcame came it to uh, write books that are permanent. Well, he's, he's a, it's a marvelous figure. He's known as Thucydides, the American Thucydides in his day, mid 19th century. He wrote 11 books the, the Conquest of Mexico and the Conquest of yeah. Peru, yeah. being the two. Uh, major ones. Um, he went to Harvard University, as his father had before him. His grandfather was involved in the um, American uh, War of Independence. It's meant to be the person who said, um, don't shoot until you see the whites of their eyes. Um, but he was leaving the repertory um, at Harvard while a student, and there's a ruckus going on behind him, and some students were mucking about. Um, and he turned, just as one of his fellow students threw um, a nobule of bread. As a metaphor, you may not accept the word nobule, but anyway, a hard crust of bread. And it hit Prescott in the eye, knocking him down, um, giving him concussion. And when he woke up the next morning, he lost the sight of that eye. And within the year, he inherited, I think, through his mother's life, a certain form of rheumatism that affected the other <laughs> man. So as you say, pretty well blind. And he wrote about these extraordinarily colorful um, societies, not just the two conquest books I made, but um, Isabella of uh, Spain and her husband. Um, and 
he was he came from this long established well off family and could afford to get recent Harvard graduates to meet him. And he assembled or bought an extraordinary amount of um, primary material and had it read to him. And he um, then had to remember, think in your own lives how much you've employed. I mean, for instance, can you remember even 15 telephone numbers? Um, he would remember, he reckoned, up to 60 pages at a time. Um, oh, I, I can't go on that story. <laughs> um, and um, one of the interesting things about his writing, which takes us back to Homer, the way Homer's, uh, 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 um, Homer's works come across to us, is um, his writing has the rhythms of spoken speech, because that was the way he could remember it, and then use the material that he read out there. So he's an extraordinary thing. So, but so, incidentally, yeah, incidentally yeah, yeah. his, as you were, agenda, not that I'm saying my agenda is so everyone's got to have an agenda, but he was writing about these wonderful, colorful societies and two great congress. Um, and he, because he couldn't be an active soldier himself, he romanticized his courtiers and other soldiers who were his, his, his subjects. So when, when I went out and I bought your book, only one? Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> So, and, and by, the, the, you can buy this book here, and you really should. And, and uh, a because it's great, uh, but it's great in a way that you can roam around. In it. It's not you don't have to start at page one and end at page seven hundred fifty. You can you can cherry pick your topics. And the the, immediate, the first chapter I went to was uh, was to the one about historical novels because I worked on. Fiction and uh, it was a terrifically interesting chapter, and it, it um, reminded me of how powerful our sense of the past is shaped not just by historians but by novelists. And I was just made a short list of books and periods. So the French Revolution, we think of the tale of two cities, of the Civil War. We think of Gone with the Wind, a book I despise, by the way. Um, uh, the Roman Empire, I, Claudius. Uh, when you think of Gilded Age, New York, Ragtime, one of my favorite books of all time. And, and lately, Tudor England um, uh, will fall and bring up the bodies. So how did, how did novelists become our kind of de facto historians? And what is the upside and the downside? Um, I don't know where to start. There's so much to say about it. Um, I'd say that, and let me say that I apologize for my voice. I had some procedure on my throat a couple of months ago. So when I squeak, I'm actually fine. I pray for your patience and indulgence. <coughs> Walter Scott. Um, Walter Scott um, who may not have been the first historical novelist. Um, there was or it's all probably before him and others before that. But in any real sense, Scott, who had begun as a poet, um, and his ballads were bestsellers, and then he realized that there's a new boy on the block, um, Byron, who was doing it far better than he. And he thought, well, if I'm going to continue to get decent sums of money, um, I'm going to turn to fiction. Um, and Jane Austen herself wrote a, a history of England, said, it's unfair that this poet is returning to, is writing fiction. He shouldn't be allowed to do it. He's doing it too well. He'll keep to what he started at. But he um, started writing about um, the border territory, um, his beloved Scotland, where he'd been brought up. He again had physical afflictions. He had um, polio as a young man and was sent by his parents um, to stay with a grand uncle, I think it was. Um, um, just north of the border between Rome and Scotland. And he fell in love with the people of that period. He had a, a grandfather um, who used to tell him great stories of the fights for Scottish independence and said that um, he would shave until Bonnie Prince Charlie um, was uh, king of Scotland. So um, Scott knew him as that 
a man with a very long, unshaved beard. Um, and he started to write uh, a series of novels um, about Scottish history. Uh, of course, he then went and wrote Ivanhoe and um, a whole series of other uh, novels, um, which um, he did really for money because he uh, bought um, a huge pile of castle um, in his beloved Scotland, and then started buying not only land, but anything vaguely medieval. Um, and it didn't matter if you know, it had actually been made just a few years previously, because he wasn't necessarily a connoisseur, but he needed cash. And so he invented things like bagpipes as a Scottish invention. He in fact invented in Egypt. Um, Scottish kilt, the storm, a whole range of things, which even now part of Scottish accepted uh, history, but they're, they're not, they're just Scots mythology, um, and um, put them into his stories. Um, um, but these books were extraordinarily, extraordinarily successful, um, starting with Waverley, uh, which I'd say do still read today, um, that series of Scottish novels. We called the Waverley novels. And they had an influence not just over um, English language um, novel writing. They had um, people taking them up in Germany, uh, Russia, um, France. Uh, Victor Hugo was told by his publishers, write a French novel um, as if it were written by Scott. Um, so that was the birth of writing about yeah. history in fictional form. It's, 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 I, I just sort of interject that, like, the uh, the entire culture of the antebellum South was largely derived from uh, from the Waverly novels. Well, the uh, show, the show, well, and I don't know the whole sense of chivalry. Mark Twain said that Scott was responsible for the American Civil War. Oh, I thought it was Harry Beecher Stowe. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you know, it's it, it's really extraordinary. It had the how how novelists can uh, still change our sense of things. So you and I are both cradle Catholics, and I'm sure that when you were um, going to school, Sir, Sir Thomas More was the the absolute epitome of just about of courage and uh, honor. And um, I, I I had to read a biography of. Uh, St. Sir Thomas More by John Farrow, Mia Farrow's father, of all things. And then along comes Hilary Mantel, and the evil Cromwell is now the really good guy, and, and Thomas More is a, is a rotten papist um, torturer of, um, of um, uh, heretics. Absolutely. I um, was lucky enough to know Hilary Mantel, who was absolutely love it as a person, apart from being a fantastic novelist. Well, I was interviewing her at a, a, a Rose Theatre in Hammersmith in West London. And I said, why did you take the line you did against Moore? And she said, well, it was from um, A Man for All Seasons, <coughs> the Robert Bolt play about Thomas Moore. Um, and I thought that the presentation of Moore, this saintly, saccharine figure just stuck in my gullet. Um, and I said, oh, I acted that, that in, in that play when I was at school. You know what part I played? She said, Thomas Cromwell. I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, she felt that that um, version of Cromwell and more was so false as against what she felt the proper historical record should show me that that was stuck in her heart. So we have a, I think we're going to, one or two more questions here, and then we will open it up to uh, the floor. So I guess we'll, um, so you quote the English historian Eric Hobsbawm, the communist Eric Hobsbawm, I say. Um, what makes a nation is the past. What justifies one nation against the other is the past, and historians are the people who produce it. Um, this, this seemed to me, oh, so history 
is not just a record, it is also a weapon. And I wonder if you would uh, talk a bit about, about history as, as ideology and as nation building and its role in that and, and things like that. Um, there's a chapter in the book called Bad Historians. And it begins with <coughs> my daughter, who is on a sports mission in Budapest. And in the center of Budapest, um, you've got a statue that is really glorifying um, the Hungarian government during the Second World War, saving its Jewish population. And a few yards away from that, um, the people of Budapest have erected their own staff, their own memorial, arguing exactly the opposite, because they say the Hungarian government is absolutely reforming what really happened, uh, the way the government at that time caved in to Nazi German pressure. And I go on to talk about how through history, you've both got um, almost the necessary um, wish on the part of nations to create an honorable and glorious mythology. Um, whether it, it's Davy Crockett um, or the heroes of the Wild West um, um, or King Arthur and the Round Table, you go through any nation and there is um, a mythology. I mean, Sweden has um, a tradition of Swedish kings. Six of them never existed. But they want, as part of mythology, to have an honorable life of, of, of uh, royal figures. Um, and I go into some detail, maybe too much, about nations <laughs> around the world uh, creating weird histories. Um, there was a mid 20th century Chinese historian who said 2,000 years of Chinese history has been totally made up by Chinese historians. Um, and Again, I suppose one of the themes of the book is that history in the world today is in crisis. Um, and the study and writing of history is in crisis. And you look at um, last November, uh, President Xi in China saying that Chinese history was going to have to be rewritten according to what this current government but it should be. And we don't have to go far to see what Putin is doing. Um, the Russian government owned the main printing presses, the main publisher um, in Russia. And Russian history is being rewritten according to the books that this publishing house publishes. Well, this is a great Russian tradition of, uh, of uh, people being erased from pictures that they, uh, with uh, Con uh, you know, Chairman Stalin. Uh, yeah. You know, the photo, they, uh, among other things, Russia had the best photo retouchers in the world. I mean, they, they could they erase just about anybody. Yeah, but it's not just Russia, where they take, they get the gold medal. Um, when uh, Eisenhower was having his affair with Kate Sonsby, um, and Eisenhower was signing, accepting um, uh, Germans uh, surrender. Um, the formal photographs of the leading figures of that sign um, show Kate Summersby um, in the background, or rather they don't, um, because she was erased from the ones that were publicly released. I, I did not know that. I, I, that's a lot to I'm sorry about that. Yeah. You, but unlike certain people who have been president, he was honest about his health stories. Um, so, but you've now got, in America, um, when I say it's a crisis, you've got two dominant versions of American history um, and how that will work out, work itself out, I don't know, but there's a crisis in the academies and there's a crisis in public perception of what on earth America's history has been. Yes, and it's playing out in our, um, in our colleges and in our school boards, uh, even as we speak. So my last question before we open it to the floor, uh, you and I were talking about this poor guy who uh, was the head of a historical, uh, an association of, of college historians. And he wrote a piece in which he cautioned against what, uh, uh, 
what he called presentism, which is the the tendency of a lot of um, uh, historians, contemporary historians, to judge the past um, on our on our standards of the present, which of course gets in the way of understanding why people acted the way they did in the past. And this was posted, and boy, was he sorry, because the furies of woke um, got after him uh, like a, like hornets. And you know, within like two days, he had to do one of these mealy mouth um, apologies. I'm sorry if anybody misunderstood me. Uh, uh, in my opinion, he had a point, but what's your opinion? Uh, it's dangerous territory, as you know, because you can hardly say anything um, about American history at present um, without either uh, one area of the public or another um, on Twitter or some other uh, social source attacking you. Um, and what I try to do in my book is just show, for instance, over the whole 1619 project um, and, and you know the history of African Americans, um, what the various decades have shown, the varying fashions that have governed um, the writing of any particular time. Um, and you know, maybe um, in 20 years' time, we'll have reached some kind of um, equilibrium yeah. from, from now. Probably not. Um, there's an exceptionally good chapter in here, which I would draw your attention to, to the historiography of the American Civil War and how, for the longest time, the subject of slavery was just kept off to one side as a uh, cause of the Civil War that the, the amazing amounts of intellectual energy were uh, applied to not to making it seem as if, nah, that's not, no, no, slavery was not an issue. It was because you had an industrial against a uh, plantation economy and all of this. And, uh, and this lasted well into the 60s, yes. Um, it's kind of shameful, really, uh, in my read about it. Um, uh, we could either talk about Winston Churchill but, yes. uh, or, or Winston. questions. Talk about Winston Churchill. Okay, Churchill. Tell us about Churchill, not as the savior of uh, Great Britain and the Western world, but as a, as a writer. And historian. Oh, I thought I was going to be able to say Winston Churchill, the public school boys fencing champion. Um, <laughs> go right ahead. Um, Take him from any angle you want. Well, nowadays, most people would say Churchill is not a great historian. Um, when he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature, he was bitterly disappointed because he wanted the Nobel Prize for peace, uh, which he thought was the one to have. Um, but he's certainly um, from very early on in his life when he was writing the history of the First World War um, through to his five volume history of the Second World War of extraordinary influence. Um, and he certainly didn't lack self confidence. In his last year, the last study he had as prime minister, um, there was a, I think it was a Rubens painting um, um, at Chequers, his country seat. And he felt that the mouse, there's a mouse in this painting, hadn't been properly painted. So he thought he could improve on Rubens, had it taken down and made the mouse more mouse like. <laughs> um, he did that? He was a big painter. Yes, he was. He really good. Uh, and the lovely stories that I mean, that you may say, why well, this really is something else. Okay. But <coughs> there's a story of his um, as you know, <coughs> Churchill, when he spoke, um, wasn't probably clear of that, just but um, 
he had some defamation um, in his mouth, shirt fruit, <laughs> etc. And so he organized he should have a, a plate put in his mouth to make it clearer. And he then said, well, people shouldn't rely on it, so not, don't make it completely good. <laughs> um, so he had this plate in his mouth, and his dermatologist or whatever, used to be able to tell in the early 1940s how the war effort was going, because Churchill would take this plane out in moments of great anger and distress and throw it across the room with his secretaries. And it then had to be mended. Um, um, but that's, I'm sorry, that's not Churchill historian. He had this fact. Well, he would be Churchill, Churchill. reported to HR now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he had all these people doing drafts for him. Um, you talk about Trump taking things to his private house. Churchill just not only used to take government um, material to his house, he <laughs> produced some of it absolutely wholesale without quoting it as, uh, you know, in quotation marks, in his history books. He had um, a whole range of people, about a dozen of them, uh, doing different kinds of research for him. <laughs> Again, without thinking them much, um, that went into the history books. But one of these uh, helpmates who said was um, being interviewed, and the interviewer would say, Well, Churchill didn't really write this stuff. You know, um, how can he lay claim to be this wonderful historian? And the researcher said, Well, look, you have never master chef. The master chef may not <coughs> peel the potatoes um, or, 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 or cut up various bits and pieces, but it's his overall vision. The, attest to the quality of the meal. And that's the kind of historian Churchill was. So yes, despite the, the, the kitchen cabinet um, brewing up all the material that was going to go out under Churchill's name, um, it's, there are his writings. And if you look at, um, I got one of the, I was allowed to put um, 16 pages of color in, in the book. And one of them is just a full page of a corrected proof from one of Churchill's books. And you've got corrections by about six different hands, different people who even there helping him correct the proofs. But it's Churchill who finally accepted them or not, and he was absolute pedant for using good English. Um, and um, there isn't really, despite all I've said, a page of Churchill's books which doesn't have the step of his particular way of writing. There, there was a, um, a an exhibit at the Morgan Library about Churchill as a writer. And he did actually did more writing than politics in his life, if you, if you took it all in all. And there were these sheets of, the, of his books that were published by Scribner's and the amazing <laughs> amount of corrections of the galley proofs. And I looked at it and I said, oh boy, the managing editor isn't gonna like this. <laughs> it was, it was uh, I mean, he had a kind of factory approach to it. <laughs> So um, I'll open it up to some questions, and then and then you can find book. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you talk about sources. Let's imagine a historian fifty years from now doing a biography on, say, let's say Donald Trump. Will there will his or her task be easier or harder with the vast array of information and sources that are now available compared to? 50 years ago, we really want to buy an hour or two. It'll be easier and harder. Um, the absence, really, of letters, um, a whole range of kinds of writing, um, which now simply aren't getting written. On the other hand, any modern history story, even now, because of the internet, because of the changes in communication, can check things, can be in contact with other scholars in the field, um, um, can just get to material in a way that wasn't possible even 30 years ago. So to that extent, access and communication will make the historian's job easier, but there are certain kinds of evidence which have gone forever, even if they never existed. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Well, I can't comment about Churchill as a historian, but he certainly was great with his character. They, excuse me, the Second World War was it was one with British brains, 
Russian blood and, Ameri and American blood race. Um, I totally agree. Um, I think that um, one of the footnotes in the book is um, when in the Second World War, one of his aides interrupted some policy meeting and said, Sir, sir, we've just learned the Italians have gone in on the side of the Germans. And Churchill fought them and said, Well, that's only fair. We had them last time. <laughs> yes, last question. As I recall, the first segment of the book is called Overture. And I was wondering if you could tell us why he called it an overture rather than a preface or an introduction or anything like that. And then also why you selected the person that you did to detail in the overture. I thought overture was a more interesting word. I also felt that in as much that it, it, uh, overtures may often rehearse some of the main musical lines of the main story, it was an appropriate word to use. Um, but it was also because I was talking to uh, a Spanish English historian who said to me, Oh, Richard, you're not going to be so boring as to begin with a lot of us and Thucydides. Everybody does that. Well, nobody's written the book I've written, I know, because. I decided to write it because I wanted to read the book. It didn't exist. Um, but I thought, God, it mustn't be boring. Dear, dear. And so I thought, well, I remember I went as a, to this Catholic school, run my Benedictine months. And from the age of 13, I was asked to study medieval history. And the um, special subject was the dissolution of the monasteries uh, in the 1530s. And the main person, who wrote about the dissolution of monasteries was a, a man called David Rhodes, who's professor of modern history um, at Cambridge. Um, and his view was the monks had it coming to them. They, you know, they were eating gluttonously, they were living lives of luxury, and lives voted to God did not seem to be at the center of their lives. Anyway, I then learned that David Rhodes had been in the very monastery that was running my school. He'd been a Benedictine monk. Um, and um, therefore, I thought, goodness, to my dim teenage consciousness, I thought, he sure had an agenda. Um, he wanted to show, in writing about the months, how monks should live and how they ought not to live, uh, as a way of saying, well, the monastery that I was in, which kicked me out because I tried to ferment a rebellion, so I said the monks ought to reform themselves, etc., etc. And that seemed to me, when I thought about it, at the heart of the story I had to tell of uh, historians having an agenda. Now, that's not to say that you know, historians um, can't really try to be objective, but I remember the uh, Tom Stoppard play, Night and Day, and one journalist in the play, um, played by John Thorne, I saw it, says to another journalist, Well, you know, I really try in my reporting, I try to be objective. And his friend says, yeah, but you objected for or objective against? <laughs> and as I also said, objectivity is, is an agenda too. So one of the, I could shower this book with lots and lots of compliments. Yes, yeah, so I don't think you want that one. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but here's the best one. This is the kind of book that sends you off to read other books. Uh, so I'm going to exercise the interviewer's prerogative, and I'm going to recommend a couple few works of history that I think you should read, and then why don't you give us a reading list? Now, the first book I would recommend, and I'm, you probably recommend it yourself, would be *The Face of Battle* by John Keegan, which I think may be the single most interesting book I ever read. Uh, fantastic. Utterly fantastic book of military history. The second most interesting book I ever read, maybe, is The Great Bridge by David McCullough about the making of uh, the Brooklyn Bridge. Fabulous book. And my last selection would be The Guns of August by Barbara Tuckman, which was one of my father's favorite books. And Barbara Tuckman is on the cover of your book. So, three or four books. Everybody should order. Really. Well, you mentioned in your kind introduction that I've written two other books. Oh. I've, actually, I've, actually, I've actually written a third book called How to Write Like Tolstoy, 
which is about right, the art yeah. of writing. And so now that you're very close to finishing your book, your biography of Morris Cowling, I recommend not as a historical book, but the art of Tolstoy to help you in your final moments. Um, um, I would recommend, um, I, I, there's a chapter um, on John Keegan in the book, um, because he wrote under appalling physical conditions for most of his life. Um, but I think that um, a book I edited and saw in the Vise one of it called The Price of Admiralty. I think it's now called the retitle for America, America uh, as War at Sea. But again, it's similar to the base of battle, and it takes three great battles at sea rather than on, on land uh, and writes about what it's like fighting to triumph over people on all ships. Um, I think that's one of them. There's another, again, sea themed book on the Spanish Armada, um, published in 1959. Um, oh, um, Massingham. Um, I can you know, remember it as soon as you can. Senile uh, Decay, which is just an extraordinary piece of history. We took 13 years to research and write it. Um, and um, in the kind of way that for me, books come alive, he describes what cannonballs could do. In other words, how accurate was shooting a cannonball or something? Um, how did you get it to fire? How dangerous was it? Answer, very dangerous. How did you carry these great balls? Um, but just the very, the, the fine detail of something that, you know, you just read about, and you go, oh, that's, it just happened. No, um, all these things in their fine detail, um, which is where novelists, historical novelists come in, um, you, you feel the moment, and that brings the moment alive. And finally, I think I'd go back to um, um, Herodotus. Uh, when I was reading Herodotus, I used to go to the supper table and read bits out to my wife uh, because they were such, they were so alive. They were, they, they were such fun, and one learned such a lot from them. And at the end, you said, Is that all? Um, could be written something else we've discovered. And one of the great sadnesses is somebody said, you know, in terms of um, the ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans, we have as much left to us as a, a building badly bombed during the Second World War, where most of what was contained in that building, library, or whatever it might be, has been destroyed. And so I just think of all the books I'd like to recommend. That we don't even know of. Richard, thank you. That was.